This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London, with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Federica Lucivero, a European Commission-sponsored research fellow in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. The topic we're going to talk about is health apps. Let's start by getting clear what a health app is. So a health app is a piece of software that runs on a smartphone or a tablet that is used for health or well-being purposes. And yeah, it's a very big definition, the way I'm putting it, because when we talk about health apps, we do refer to many very different things. So this might be something that measures your pulse, it might measure your blood pressure, or it might measure how many hours of sleep you had the night before. Yes, but it could also be something, you know, an app where you can you know, find information about a certain condition. It could be an app that you can use to book an appointment with your general practitioner or to check specific conditions. So it could be an education tool for medical students or a consultation tool for doctors. So it seems to me we're living in an age where there's been an explosion of this kind of thing that suddenly in the last 10 years have been any number of these apps emerging on the market? Absolutely. When I first started with my project, the numbers was like 97,000 apps that were available on the market. This was 2013. And the prediction at the time was that by 2017, the market would go up to $26 billion in this field. So it's in many, many big companies have been investing in this field. And recently, different uh, governmental bodies have been looking at these apps because they, they started realizing that they really need to start regulating them. So presumably, different apps require different kinds of regulations. So something which is used specifically in a medical context needs to be closely monitored for accuracy and so on. But something which is just a general health app, would that really need to be regulated? Well, that's exactly the question. And it's a very important question nowadays because the initial idea and the the initial position by bodies like the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, but also by regulatory bodies in the UK. So the initial idea was, yes, if the app is not related to a medical device, then doesn't have to be regulated. Things have been shifting because what has been noticed is that there are some apps that do not fall under the definition of medical device, but they still raise questions about quality because they are still dealing with health data. What sort of thing are you talking about here? Simple apps used by many of us. For example, uh, at the beginning of this year, the Dutch Data Protection Authority stated that the data that are used and collected and processed by fitness apps uh, used by runners, for example, uh, they are still dealing with health data and should therefore make sure that you know, this type of data is protected. But then this means that if our running habits are health data, what is not? And in that sense, I'm saying even like fitness and wellness apps require specific attention in terms of their quality. Quality with respect to the way data is protected and people's privacy is protected. Because of course, if we can infer something about people's health from running data, then this means that also this data become you know, sensitive. But also quality related to the accuracy of the information produced by this app. That's really interesting. So you're saying that fitness apps, their data can imply things about somebody's health, or they may actually capture health-related data. And because of that, they should at least be considered as part of the medical world or should fall under medical regulation. Well, not necessarily under medical regulation, but they should be governed. Uh, It cannot just be said uh, these are uh, consumer products. Uh, We do need a way to assess their quality. Are you saying there isn't really a clear distinction between medical apps and more generally health apps? 
I, I'm saying that there are clearly medical apps, and then there is a huge gray area of apps that are in between. And, and I think it's this hybridity of apps that are not clearly medical apps, but can be used in medical domains or apps that are used in health-related domains, in fitness and wellness domains. It's this exactly this hybridity of apps that is causing, I think, interesting debates you know, at the level of governance of these apps. And it's also created a lot of questions for app developers who don't quite know what type of regulation they should adhere to, or with respect to doctors who do not know whether they can advise patients to use some apps or not. And patients, imagine a patient who is having sleep disorders and they want to use, there are so many apps available for people with sleep disorders. How do you know what is a good app? There are so many available. Well, more than that, the truth seems to be that we live in this age where apps have proliferated and they're giving us a kind of self-knowledge about various aspects of our behaviour that we never had access to before and nobody really knows what to do. Yes, absolutely. And as I was saying before, is this hybrid nature of the apps that I found particularly interesting is the fact that some of them are in between the domain of what is health and what is medical and in what is lifestyle and kind of consumer product. And, you know, this distinction has never been so stark. Everything that pertains to our life is in between uh, you know, our lifestyle and thus pertain to our health. But the interesting thing is that this distinction has been used to regulate specific aspects of our life in terms of liability, in terms of health reimbursement policies, in terms of certifications. We try to distinguish what is medical and what is not. And the interesting thing is that all these apps that have popped up in the last three years are really challenging these existing distinctions and the governance tools that we have and require us really to rethink about the role of these distinctions and what is about what is medical and what is not that is really relevant. Do you think the existence of health apps changes the nature of medicine and what counts as medical? Yes, I I think it does. The fact that people have such a wealth of data available, the fact that there is more and more marketing by big companies about how you can know yourself better through this data, through these graphs that they produce for you. This does change it. So there is something about the way we know uh, ourselves, the way we understand disease, but there is also something about the way we deal with it. It's something about self-management because these apps not only give information, but they also tell people how to deal with this information. They advise people on actions that can be taken and so on. So it's this whole idea of what is the role of the doctor and what is the role of the patient and how the patient acquires some expertise that before was just left to the doctors. And I'm not claiming that this is only happening with the health apps. Some of these trends are uh, recognizable in, in other domains as well and because of other technologies. But... But I find this is particularly striking. It seems to me that one aspect of this is that the patient or the individual user of an app is empowered or at least has the illusion of being empowered by the information, by the new access to stuff that was always the province of a doctor before. Yes, that's what many app providers and app developers promise. The promise of empowering patients is really dominant in the in the rhetoric and in the marketing of these apps. The, the, the problem is, what is the meaning of empowerment in this context? We are empowered when we can do something, when we have the power of doing something. Having a graph or having some details about your sleep patterns or having some details about your heartbeat doesn't necessarily empower people to do something about that. And I'm not saying that every app is guilty of uh, not empowering people. What I'm saying is that it's sometimes a too easy rhetoric 
to say that having this information at hand or in your pocket will empower patients. In order to empower patients, I think, is the entire system that needs to adapt, the entire system that has to allow patients to, to play a role, a more active role in their care. Federica lucci Fro, thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for listening to Health in Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.